right? And the company is called Pay Echo. And right now, if you look at the company, you know, they have more than uh, 110, uh, subscri 110 million subscription, uh, about 180 million of mobile user, and then uh, also about 150 million of uh, credit card registered. And if you look at Apple, iPhone, you know, all those iTunes, mobile money transfer from here to international is all via this company. And also C-Trip, Disneyland, all those were via this company. So their portfolio, everything is quite healthy. You know? Within that, you know, they, we also help them to do a lot of AI uh, to develop some tool able to uh, reduce the faults. Used, used to be, it's about like a 70% uh, is good one, you know, about 20 something percent of fault, you know, particular from like a, a mountain area, you know, all those, you know, they uh, like to steal a lot of money from. There are so many tricks, you know, but AI able to identify, you know, and we work some tool from some of the PhD thesis research, you know, and then we able to identify close to the hit rate about 95% right now. So I think it's based on big data and also cloud technology, you know. So our interest also very interested in big data, cloud and also AI, uh, BI area. Yeah. So yeah. So th today I have been giving some talk before you. That's why my voice is okay. Okay, and then uh, I'm also sitting the uh, board of, uh, I'm an IND, you know, independent uh, director for NASDAQ company, you know, also. So if you need some idea or advice on, on the board, you know, I also be able to provide some people. Yeah. So what you're saying uh, in terms of the company boards, in terms of uh, IPO also? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The company, after IPO, I sit in the board, you know, and, and one of the companies is actually in NASDAQ, yeah. Oh wow, so you're also familiar with all the rules of Oh, not all. You know. If you say all, it's, there are lots of violations. I'm not qualified to say that, right? But I have to talk to my lawyer first. Okay. Yeah. So usually I have a portfolio. You know, I have portfolio stuff. You know, and also I have two or three lawyers working in parallel you know, because there are lots of sensitive data and all the information I have to go through. So I'm quite sensitive on all those. Okay. So today it's only personal talk. You know. It's not related to any of my company or my portfolio. Yeah, that's very important for legal reasons. Right, for legal reasons. Speaking okay. on behalf yeah. of the company. Right. right. Now. So it's only personal advice, not be on behalf of any company I I, I engage right now. It's only okay. representing himself. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> or just uh, without prejudice. <laughs> that's legal way to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And uh, one last thing. So you sounds like you have a lot of connections in Silicon Valley. Oh uh, so, yes, yes. So if you find the right startup, with potentially you can do some mentoring and help them with connections and so on. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. I, I, I always do it from. Uh, I don't know the person from Berkeley. Are you from UC Berkeley? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. also right. part of the alumni there. You know, so some of my brothers, you know, they they are running some funds in in Shanghai, such as like a Warden Fund, you know, Fu uh, Army Fund. And uh, if the product is good, and map map their portfolio or investment, you know. I can refer and try to get you in touch, you know, and try to get it successful. You know. Maybe I can charge something <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like that small percentage share or make your company, you know, successful in the long run. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> right. and also, I'm a professor in some of the university around Hong Kong and China. I'm also the uh, enterprise professor for a uh, uh, small university in Shanghai called Jiao Tong Da Xue. Yeah, some of the students just got graduated. Yeah, so if you need help, you know, on enterprise professor or, or whatever, I can active, you know, help you with advice quite a lot of area. Because I've been working with uh, SAP and also PeopleSoft, Oracle, you know, uh, some ecosystem. I know quite a lot of technology inside out. Okay, and I can help you to successful, you know, and uh, one of my student get a PhD degree, you know, he was using uh, one of the talk I give in uh, Lego and Robotics in Java. So he basically, about in year 2008, he used the idea of providing a lot of things. He got a, a doctor degree from uh, uh, Nanjing University. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Take it away. Just talk about, about your history. Price, though, raising money. Okay.
yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Moon. Um, I actually just came from Hong Kong. I work in a company called Shadow Factory. Uh, it's a VR, AR, and MR company. If you, if you don't, guys don't know what that means, virtual reality, augmented, and mixed reality. So gaming, things like that, digital stuff. Um, not much fun, actually. Um, <laughs> I mean, my, my, my life is just not as interesting as Lawrence. So um, <laughs> I, I don't have that much to share, to be honest. But uh, okay, I'll keep it short. Um, I actually started off my first company when I was in college. Uh, when I was 21 years old, it went really, really bad. Um, I kind of got into a very bad investor. That's the reason why. So, uh, so yeah. So we're very it. lucky to have you because I think you learn more when things go wrong. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I can share a lot of negative experiences with you guys so you guys don't fall, fall into the trap. Um, so after that, I actually went through an accelerator program, a startup accelerator, just like Techstars, uh, Founder Institute, that's the one that I went through. Um, so there was my, that was actually my second startup. Um, I didn't manage to go forward with it afterwards since I got invited to join my current company, which is um, a digital company, and I actually do business development for them, investor relations, like overseas expansion, basically everything, project management. Uh, apart from production. So um, that's a bit of my background. Um, yeah, I mean, like, to start off with, like, fundraising, I mean, I haven't had a long enough life to share with you, I guess. But um, <laughs> that's the thing. Uh, whenever you start a company, you better make sure you have a clear vision, uh, whether or not you're just basically like some coffee shops looking for an IPO, like super fundraising and burning money, burning cash. That's one way, of course. Um, mostly what they do in, in mainland China as well, I would say. Uh, but let's say if you're actually, can I, can I have a show of hands who, who in the audience is actually a, an entrepreneur himself? Who has launched more than one company? Okay. Who hasn't even launched anything yet? I'm just having an idea, I just want to be an entrepreneur. Oh, great, okay. Well, basically, I mean, first of all, you start off with nothing. You start off with bootstrapping, that's always the way. There is no other way of doing it. You can go into some, some like random guys and say, guys, do you have money for me? I, I am like, I have this super cool idea. I mean, that just, just doesn't work. If you're doing some hard of, uh, hardware startups, you can always go for uh, like, let's say, uh, crowdfunding, you can always go for, um, like, uh, there are a lot, a lot of platforms online that can help you uh, with crowdfunding and also like angel funding, that's what you start off with, your friends, your family, that's always the way. Um, but when you're talking about, okay, let's go to the VC, let's get this serious, um, you always, always have to make sure, not just you have to make your portfolio good, but you have to make sure that the investor's portfolio is actually good as well. Um, there are a lot of investors out there who doesn't actually know what they're doing. They're just like, oh, this is so cool. This is, um, this is, I don't know, like just dump out like a bunch of jargons, and they'll be like, yeah, we'll invest in you. Don't take the money. That's that's not real money. There are a lot of times that these investors just they are startups as well. Basically, there are only two people in the venture capital. That's what they do. And um, so, and also watch out if there are actually investors who aren't um, helping you a lot. There are a lot of investors who like to be hands-on, who likes to interview with your business, and they're like, I am part of this business, I'll take like 80% of your equity, and I'll leave you with 20, even though you're the one who's doing all the work, I'm not paying you a salary, I'm not paying you anything, so you can't actually live. Um, so there are actually quite a lot of scams out there <laughs> that you need to watch out when you're uh, fundraising. I mean, it's, if possible, try to always, always go for um, a good investor with a good portfolio. Let's say, I mean, who doesn't want to be invested by Sequoia? Um, it's just the way it is, right? But the thing is, like, will they invest in you? But if they don't, what's the alternative? Always get, give yourself a plan B. Always go and knock on doors. You can knock on, like, I don't know, 100 doors until you actually get one reply. Doesn't matter, go to elevator pitches, go to all kinds of like pitching competitions. Get as much cash as you can, even from the government, it's good cash. I mean, it's good money, it's easy money. So um, there are a lot of these kind of things that you can get, 
get yourself started with at least to survive for another like half a year. I mean, it's it's a tough tough time. It's a tough journey, um, but it's not easy these days. And especially there are a lot of startups, and especially like a lot of uh, TNT, um, a lot of different like O2O kind of platforms. It's very saturated. Um, so you you bet you better make sure that you actually have a have a standing point and also like a good team um, and also like let's say if you're already racing the second round or the third round make sure that you have like good investors at the beginning that they will look at because they will be part of the board and like the upcoming investors they are gonna definitely gonna look at okay so this this just like random guy from nowhere gave you money and where did the money come from? What about that? Like, what did you, what did you do with it? There are a lot of these things that you need to make sure you is on the back. Yeah, it is very exciting. Um, hi, I'm Brian. Uh, I am here. Well, I guess I started in the U.S. and I'm very much into the way that we live and the way that technology changes the way that we live. So that led me into smart homes. So I started off in a smart home company in the US, uh, up until they were bought up by Google, and then I traveled for a bit, and then I joined another smart home company uh, right as they were getting ready to start a crowdfunding campaign, which is uh, what I'll speak to you mostly about today. So the campaign ended up being very successful. We broke the record for uh, smart home campaigns and raised, uh, at the time it was like 1.8 million, but um, ended up taking money out becoming like 1.7. So uh, 1.7 million, and at the time I was the only person on the marketing side. Um, so I was doing the marketing, and then also the only person doing the operations for the campaign. So I needed to work with all the customers every day. Um, and I guess if you can imagine being in a in a campaign where you have a goal that's like maybe like this much money, and then you just blow past it. Um, all of a sudden I found myself in a position where I needed to manage all these expectations and uh, we didn't have any system set up to, to do any of that stuff. So I can talk a lot about what it's like going through a crowdfunding campaign and, um, and the pros and cons of that. And uh, since then I uh, left that company last year to start my own startup. So I've also raised investment from angel investors through that startup. Uh, so I can also talk about that. <laughs> Mailchimp and like Google Suite, pretty okay. much. I recently tried to send like 6,000 emails through uh, Gmail and got shut down in minutes. So. <laughs> yeah. It was like shipping information, it wasn't spam. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it's like they want this, but no. Right. <laughs> yeah, oh. All right, cool. Um, so I think I would just take a, so I, I want to just talk really kind of for a few minutes about kind of different, different options, the very broad strokes for raising money. So uh, we have we now have crowdfunding, which we can talk about, um, and then outside of that is like obviously bootstrapping, which is like the first thing everybody does, which means using your own money, um, and then angel investing. And uh, let's uh, so I'm going to talk, and if I say something wrong, correct me. All right, so I'm just going <laughs> to make this up. But uh, but if the angel investing is like somebody with uh, more money than you have, so it could be like a dentist or somebody or a retired person. Somebody who's just going to give you a chunk of money, and uh, the terms are usually not so complicated because it's, just, it's not like a company; it's usually a person. Um, and it's sort of this joke that angels never get never get paid back because the terms. <laughs> because like it's not it's not as efficient. I guess because the the contract is not as tight, so it's often harder for them to get their money back. Uh, and then we have after that is uh, venture capital. And venture capital seems to be done in different rounds. So you have like an A, a round, and a B round, and a C round. And usually nobody does a D round, because either by then you should either die or, or after that would be IPO, which is when you go on to the stock market. Um, is there anything else? Any other ways to raise money? I guess uh, maybe government, but I think that's the other way. Um, and then there's just staying private. Uh, that's the other option. Um, Reverge. Merge or you mean merge with another company. So, but that's mean you raise a company yourself and then you really want to get bigger, you merge? Oh, okay. How do you get more customers? Uh, um, usually, you know, 
When you go to series C, right, you try to look for very strategic partners, somebody able to help you to successful, you know, go to IPO. You know. If you are not able to do that, you know, and then try not to get series C. You know. But in the past, you know, also, you know, uh, according to one of the company I work for, uh, called Mdor, you know, Dr. Mdor, Jean Mdor. Actually, Jean is a very good teacher, you know. Probably somebody in here, if they are old enough in 40s and, and 50s, they know about Mdor company, you know. Mdor was the fellow of IBM. He actually created all those, like a 360, uh, 390, all those systems, you know. But he's smart enough, you know, he tried to create more supercomputer, but IBM don't allow him, you know. So he just jumped out to create his own company. But at that time, you know, he used a lot of angel money, right? Such as from Fujitsu and a few other things, you know. So later, the company become a burden, you know, by the angels, you know. Actually, don't believe in angel. That's Amdor theory, right? Amdor has a lot of theory, you know, supercomputer theory, all the things, you know. And one of the top students from uh, Gene Amdor is Larry. I think you probably know a person called Larry Ellison. Larry Ellison, he actually worked for Amdor, it's the first job he had, right? And then Amdor has sold lots of supercomputers to Japan. That's why Larry later loved Japan culture, which is original from uh, Tang Dynasty in China. When they built a house in Rebel City, you know, it's actually 100% built in Japan and then take it apart and move to California. So Amdor taught Larry, say, do not use angel money unless necessary because angel is not your friend. He will take your company apart and everything will destroy it. Yeah. If you don't find somebody really you can trust, right? But for, for us, you know, we do a lot of angel because, for example, we know the person very well, you know, and they don't much care about that money. For example, such as the people rich enough, such as Masayoshi-san. You know Masayoshi-san, right? He's from SoftBank, yeah. The chairman of SoftBank, yeah. So he will diversify the portfolio, you know. He helped some of our company quite successful in angel stage or whatever. And he also able to link up us with uh, some of the top C-levels, such as uh, Mr. Guo of Foxconn, Guo Taiming, yeah. And then uh, we able to travel to Taiwan, you know, and Mr. Guo will invite his wife and the kids together to have dinner with us, you know. That shows the sincerity. If you're able to reach that level, you know, then try to believe they are the angel. If not, they are the devil, you know, they will be seeing the board, you know, try to destroy you, you know, everything. They are not friends, yeah. I think in the board, one of the ideas, you got to have somebody able to protect the CEO, you know, and then the board member is very important. And a lot of people, you know, inside here, you know, they will choose the direction, you know, whatever you try to do, the next generation technology, all the things, they will try to veto it and cut it, and then later, it's just a quiet take over your company you know, or whatever, you know, and then you, you give up your whole idea of your energy, everything, you know, just like uh, Moon mentioned about it. Yeah, because I work for Sun, you know, so we are the same. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's the, about what I can share in, in that perspective. Okay, so, so the basic problem is, you know, when you're seeking angel investment, you're really small. Right here, I want to expand on this angel thing real quick. So, uh, so, when you're, so when you're seeking angel money, you're very small, and you, you probably look like a nobody. So the angels come in, and they're probably older than you, and then they think that you know nothing and they want to start managing you and then if you do are successful they want to start taking money and start controlling the company. Is that the basic problem? Yeah, that's why you know we usually we have our own funding, you know, as uh, investment as like a, a penny share or as the share director, all those things. Try not to get a lot of angel money. Yeah. And then whoever series A will help you to from one to ten times of portfolio. Series B may be 10 to 100 times or whatever, you know, and then you have to from there, maybe Series C, you know, you get able to find somebody, see your direction, everything is clear, you know, the product is out, you know, and you create a lot of publicity, and then help you to jump start, you know, just step into IPO or whatever, you know, they will create your exit plan you know, for all the other, you know, and try to clean up the other, whatever, your negative force inside the company, because we, we, we shall not have a lot of, negative force, you know, you have to have maintain a all wood behind one arrow, you know, else running staff is already difficult enough. 
and then you feel about some negative force inside the board. It's like negative, negative force to mean like you know emotional problems within the board. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if their direction is very short sighted, you know, they always try to exit or sell the company or or whatever, you know, and, and suck it up, you know. That, that's that's you may call it a sucker. <laughs> like a blood sucker. Right, right, right. right. And that's really dangerous. Yeah, right. yeah. And then if you have inside your board, you know, if that's the kind of problem, you know, that's a serious problem. Well, okay, alright. Uh, that was impressive. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I can add a bit on to your first point that you just made. Um, so the company that I'm working with now is actually uh, quite interesting as, as in the business model. It's just not. We're not just selling digital content. Um, so there are a lot of things that uh, different companies do, especially with valuation, when they are trying to sell it, trying to exit, trying to IPO, trying to go to the next stage of funding or whatever. Um, so there are a lot of times, especially, I mean, it's my boss's decision, but um, there are a lot of times that we do uh, acquisition of other boutique firms. Um, it's it's pretty much, I mean, when you are asking for money, when you're doing some kind of fundraising, think of the reason why. Don't just do it for the sake of, like, of course, I mean, you need to live, but otherwise, let's say for us, we do one round of our investment. That's the, re the reason behind it is because we need to grow. And how much do you need to grow by? Let's say if you're like opening up a restaurant just next to next to like or opposite the street or something, you can just stay the same size. You don't need to raise money. You can bootstrap. You can work your way through it. That's called traditional business. That's not a startup. If you're working towards a startup, you need to like your investor will expect you or expect your company to double or triple the size within like two to three years. So this is what they're looking for. I mean, my company grew from when I joined January last year, which was a year ago. We started off with 16 people. Now we have 70 people. Um, and the office is just like triple the size, quadruple the size. And the reason behind it is because uh, we kept raising money. And the, the, the whole point is that we can sell it ASAP. So this is one of the um, techniques or one of the directions that you can go for. But let's say you're just there, I, I, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to own my own business, I want to like have, have my own life instead of like being, being threatened every day at work by my boss. If that's what you want, you probably don't need to fundraise. Um, think of the reason why, yeah. otherwise your life will be very, very difficult. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think there's, yeah, when, when you're fundraising, you need to have a, a reason why you're fundraising, uh, certainly. Uh, at very minimum, like why is someone getting, going to give you money? They're expecting some sort of return for that. Or they're just your friend, which is that really early stage uh, fundraising. You know, some of the first money that I got into my company was from just friends, you know, they say like four X round, like friends, family, founders, and fools, right? Um, but then other investors who don't know you, yeah, they want a return. Either it's money or maybe they think you're developing into an interesting IP that could work into their business somehow or, or form some partnership in the, in the future. Um, but, you know, I think there is also, you know, there are other sorts of businesses that aren't the, you know, scalable startup route of business. Uh, for example, I've got a cousin back in the U.S. He opened this uh, really cool coffee business. So he just makes this really... Um, niche type of coffee, and he got angel investors uh, to give him money, and, and they don't expect his business to grow much. He's not trying to grow, but they just thought what he was doing is really cool. So sometimes people get involved in their personal story, and they want to join whatever you're doing. Uh, so there's a lot of variety, but definitely when you're raising money, you don't want to grab as much money as you can because you could. There are downsides to that, right? You're giving up a lot of equity. Uh, of your company, so you know there are founders who find themselves working in their company, but the amount of equity they have is shrunk by so much that they realize there's no financial gain in the company for them anymore. So you know if you do this, and, and this is particularly difficult in hardware startups um, because hardware startups need to raise a lot more money, right? The, the hardware costs are significantly higher than software costs. So um, typically, founders that have 
gone into that situation were from hardware startups. Yeah. So it seems like right now there's an argument that uh, like Google AdWords and Facebook ads, they're costing about, for every dollar that you make, they cost about 40% 40 40 is spent in advertising. So that means that 60%, 60 cents of every dollar is spent on you know, technology of your product. And I'm kind of thinking it's, we're starting to see a trend away from software, toward, away from technology towards you know, the Dollar Shave Club or like, you know, the Casper mattress or something. And so it seems like a lot of companies are, they need us to switch to a more simplistic model because there's less opportunity um, to make money in the startup world because the Google's taking so much money, Google and Facebook are taking so much of the, the money now. Um, and you need to exit faster, basically, as far as I can tell it's not. All right, so let's, let's talk about how do you find uh, angel investors and then uh, how do you find VC investors? Let's talk about it. Well, in terms of angel investors, the I'd say three routes that um, that I've used. One, uh, early angels are people that you know or kind of their network, so maybe one step removed from you. Uh, the second route would be, you know, there's always like websites you can find angels on, right? Uh, and you find people who are interested in uh, three parts. Uh, they, they kind of overlap you in, in three ways. They are in, interested in your industry. So, you know, I'm doing an AI IoT uh, platform for home automation. So, if I find someone in healthcare, like that's just not going to work. So, they're matched up with your industry. They're matched up with your stage. So, if you're, you know, pre-seed going into like a that kind of angel round, and these angels are only working with like A rounds, then that's not going to work for you as well. And the third thing is check size. So, if someone writes, you know, million dollar checks. They're just not interested in a two hundred thousand dollar raise because for for them, just financially, it's not it's not worth it for them. Um, so you know that's the second round finding finding angels like that, and then third is like networking events and just kind of in real life. So yeah, either through your network, online, or networking events. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing I mentioned is that uh, I know a number of angel investors, and none of them wanted to come and speak at my event. <laughs> angels, they don't want to be public, as far as I can tell. So they're, they're difficult to find. So basically it seems like either you need to uh, either push, push the, your brand, like make sure your company is as famous as possible um, so that the angels can find you, or you need to ambush them. And so I think, uh, and it also seems like, you know, email is like too, too easily you know, dismissed. So um, it seems like you either need to work, uh, talk to Lawrence and work with like LinkedIn to find Find people close to the person you want to, to uh, and then give, find the person closest to them and then give them the tools to, uh, to approach your target person. Um, because people always, you always trust your friends more than, you know, than random email. So, uh, so it actually takes a lot of social engineering to get close to the, the investors that, that might be right for your company. Uh, because you really got to find someone who's interested in your industry, somebody who can help you with networking, help you into the industry, and then also writes the right size checks for your business. You need someone on your team that's very, very good at networking, right? Uh, like, I, I remember the last startup I was working at, they were talking about one of the angel investors who they found earlier on, and, you know, they were, they just said, like, angels are everywhere. They just kind of find them magically sometimes. So they're at a dinner, and, you know, they're talking about their business. This person says, oh, that sounds cool. I can give you $100,000 for that business. And you know, they had no clue this guy was an investor. So, you know, if you're if if you're a founder or especially if you're the founder doing the like business side, you need to be telling everybody you meet like what you're doing, what you're looking for, because you know, there are opportunities out there that, that uh that you miss if you don't do that. So so I think uh they're screw angels, right? I, I, I also believe some of the angels. <laughs> I think for most of the staff, if you are small enough, you know, and then uh, you are diversified. You know, not, not many people know who you are, where you come from, why should I invest on you. Know? I think you probably have to look for something, you know, from your college, you know, your you, university, there's some funding, right? For example, like uh, uh, Google or whatever, lots of companies, you know, of course, they are from top university in the world, right? You know, the university professor sometimes they will invest on you, you know, or the funding. You know, for example, uh, the company I work for, one of the yeah, 
it was influenced by Tsinghua you know, and Gu. You know. So if you are, have those kind of alumni or connections, right, trust those, those, those are good angels, right? And then, of course, you know, just like we mentioned about, you know, there are lots of government funds, you know, and there's something like a Qian Ren Ji Hua, all those, but be careful if you are related to US government right now, it's pretty sensitive. Right? So then, uh, some of those, like uh, Phoenix and, and a few other projects, you know, they have lots of funding, you know, in, in around top cities in China, you know, because I guess some funding from uh, Changzhou before, you know, they give you three million easily, you know, without any cause or whatever, you know, or terms or condition, you know, as long as you're able to succeed, maybe four years later, you can return it or uh, pass away without interest, you know, all those things look quite nice, you know. But you have to look for your government. For example, in Hong Kong, right? I, I will be able to look at Hong Kong government, you know, there's uh, some of trade, development, all those, you know, they will link up with like a Zhejiang, you know, or Jiangsu, or some of the area, you know. They have special funding on e-commerce or all those, you know. Those were quite easy to do, you know. Particularly if you have some kind of leading uh, experts, such as in FinTech, and you're from Hong Kong, you've been doing this film, you know, and other things, you know. It's easy to connect to that, you know, and you become one of the key, uh, maybe hatching fund, or somehow they will help you to be successful in that area. And, uh, but just keep your eye open, you know, ask for some of those that are, uh, people usually try to look for the best candidate they can find, you know, and then maybe some of your university, you know, related alumni, you know, they will be able to help you out quite a lot, you know. So, it happens to me and it, it was quite successful in the past, yeah. So, uh, so I guess in some sense you want to do a certain, uh, uh, a due diligence on your angel investors. So, uh, and so I think, I guess, probably one of the things we want to look for in an angel, like uh, one, one complaint is that some investors, they call spray and pray, which is, means they invest in everything they see and then they pray for success. And I think Peter Thiel, I guess on the rule that he only invests in seven companies at a time so that he can uh, put more of his energy in helping the startups. Um, but what other, is there maybe, uh, so what are ways to, uh, to do research on the angel people and then what are traits you look for? Well, just like we mentioned about, we try to look for a bigger one, right? Yeah, not one or two people as uh, uh, angels, right? Usually, they have a good portfolio of investment, you know. So whatever they expect, you know, maybe only five percent of their investment will be successful, and a lot of them maybe ten to twenty percent maybe crash and burn, you know. In the middle of those, they would not survive or would not die either, you know. So it will be hanging. And then that's why you know if they're big enough, they're able to even it out and, and everything you know, in their portfolio. So that would not be that uh, that huge pressure on you. And also with their portfolio, you know, they're able to help you with success or merge with other portfolio they have, you know, and then make you bigger or what your lack of uh, skill or technology or whatever, you know, they will try to even out and you know, give you advice what's the right way to do, you know, what's the trend, you know, or what's their direction next year. And maybe they try to, what's their fund able to invest in, you know. So, so I think, try to be honest what what you're able to do, you know, and then let them see your direction clearly, you know, and try not to track back and forth, you know, and then nobody understand what your technology will be end up with, you know, and that, that's a very serious problem if you are not able to deliver. And also, they look at your team. It's a teamwork, you know, your team, your board, director, board of directors, you know, all those portfolio got to be very supportive to each other, you know, try not to be duplicate uh, your team, teamwork or effort, you know, and that, and it's very clear, you know, they can see this is the company, we try to grow it bigger, and, and that you have the skill, you know, and you are, you are, your board of director is very good, you know, and, and they, they trust on that. Yeah. And try not to be a, a uh, just a single hero, you know, and then it's quite quite dangerous, you know. What happened if that guy got hit by a car, you know, and the her company will be whole totally screwed or something like that. Yeah. yeah um, top of that, I actually have two other points that I would like to make. Uh, the first one is actually. Um, something that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, which is uh, what I went through myself, uh, accelerators and incubators. Um, so let's say if you're doing some, some kind of tech startup, some startups that are 
uh, industry specific. Let's say I am doing uh, like a property tech, for example. Um, you would actually go for a lot. There are a lot of conglomerates out there, a lot of property companies, like developers. They are running their own incubation programs, which they are providing like seed funding for um, new um, startups and new companies. Um, you can try and go for those. That's one of the choices because afterwards, honestly speaking, what they want to do not just incubate you, but maybe buy your company as well. So that might be a good choice. And the second thing that you can do is uh, go th go to the accelerators. Let's say you are like a complete newbie. You don't you have never had a business before, not even like an Amazon or like a Taobao um, uh, shop or whatever. So you can start off with like applying to accelerators like. Um, the most famous one will be like Y Combinator, a lot of us would know that. Um, so let's say if you actually start from that, it's more or less like going to university, like I get a good degree from Harvard, and why not? Then uh, that is actually quite competitive getting into these accelerators as well. But as long as you have this portfolio, it's way easier to get, your, get yourself or get your footsteps into the door of um, like a, an investment company or like a VC. Um, and especially, you need to really, I, I really hate to say this because uh, this is unfair to a lot of people, but entrepreneurship, it's, it's very like discriminating against uh, introverts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean like I used to be an introvert myself as well, um, but I, I learned to open up and that's what I need to do if I need to run my business. And especially just like, just like what you mentioned, it was, it, you need someone who knows how to network. It's not just about drinking or whatever, but you need someone know, who knows how to present your idea, to pre present the, vi the vision of the company, um, and as well as get people interested. I mean, that's the reason why people are going through these uh, trainings of like pitching, elevator pitches, like you need to pitch yourself in 30 seconds, not just yourself, not just your team, your company, and a lot of different other stuff. Like, why, why should I let you, let you in my office um, within that 30 seconds. That, that's what you need to keep practice on. Um, yeah, so. Alright, so, uh, so maybe, should we talk a little bit about contracts? Like, what are the basic elements of contracts and which we look out for? I'm not a legal person. I'm not a legal person. I'm not a legal person. Lawyers work. Okay, so that's the advice. Get lawyers to work for you. I can say the first thing. There's a book that is fantastic on this. It's called "Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer," and uh, I mean, I read really, it. I loved it, but it's also highly recommended from actually multiple lawyers as well. Okay, right. <laughs> um, and it kind of covers every detail about what's in a uh, term sheet and, and how you should deal with that. The advice that I've heard most frequently is to focus on. Um, the, the control, like how much equity you're giving up, and, and your valuation. So everything outside of that is um, less and significantly less important than those two things. Having said that, there are lots of things that could um, be very painful in situations in which things go bad. Generally, if things are good, then it, it's kind of okay. Um, but also, you, you need to look at these negotiations as a long, you know, it's, it's not a, you're not in a short game with, with these people. Um, whoever you, you'll be working with, you're uh, kind of about to get married to them, and so you need to consider whether a specific point is very important, or if the relationship is more important in, in that in that time. Cool. Well, okay. So the book is called "Be Smarter Than Your Lawyer." Okay, and then the other one is like uh, no, obviously No Low Press has all kinds of great books on stuff, but I've also discovered that a lot of um, you should not get all your information from just books when it comes to the law because a lot of stuff that all the lawyers know they cannot write because it will get them in trouble, but everybody knows it. And so if you talk to a lawyer, uh, they can tell you things you cannot find on the internet or find in books. There's certain things that everybody knows, but they can't write it down. So that's worth pointing out. Um, let's, let's see, the next, so. so. So I don't know about your area of a startup, you know, but for hours, you know, we write up a lot of patterns. Yeah, and we register lots of those kind of patent information. That's why, you know, even though we, uh, when we try to get the company sold, we get a lot of uh, assets inside. And then, uh, for example, 
a mobile phone, you know, there are so many patterns, how to flip, you know, how to design or lay out all those things. Each one could be a pattern, you know, and then we register. Every month we have maybe hundreds of patterns, you know, whatever, you know, coming up, you know, and then it requires, you know, we still own that, you know. If you have some pattern, you know, try to be very clear or whatever, you know. Maybe it's under your name or whatever, you know, and then you separate out, you know, if the company is so well, you know, you're able to bring it back some of the stuff, you know, for carry on the future for that or whatever. And then you have to know what your goal of the company is it to sell out as an exit plan or IPO as an exit plan or merge with other company or whatever. You know, there's so many ways you can play around. But you've got to have a good uh, CFO, you know, how to play all those like the financial data also, yeah. Other than legal, right? and then that will be able to uh, bring up your company to be a, a better share you know, in, in front of the uh, investors. Yeah. Actually, I had a question for you about that. Um, when, when has can you, can you talk about some examples of where the having an exit plan in mind changed the route that an entrepreneur wanted to pursue, or, or the company wanted pers wanted to pursue? So if you're gonna if you're gonna merge, or if you're gonna IPO, or if you're not, what? Yeah. I, yeah. I think um, so. In the past, I most of the company I, I invest in, you know, they lucky enough. Most of the investor want to get an IPO, and then they see a future of IPO. There, are only one of the earliest company, you know, we, we, we put in, you know, it's not clear enough because the product was so diversified. You know, we were in core centers, we are also in CRM, and then we also have John Venture in in Beijing, you know, and, and that's why, you know, but we got a lot of money, you know, from uh, one of the top energy companies, you know, uh, I think probably most people know, you know, Dynergy, yeah, you, you heard about this company, it's in Texas, they are very rich, you know, in, in also in about year 2000, you know, there's a company called Enron, en Enron run into a scandal, and then uh, almost went to bankruptcy and then Dynergy by Enron. At the same time, we put a lot of investment on our uh, Asians, you know, operation. You know. We got 30 million. Because in year 2000, you know, it's just like they see your portfolio, you got from this university and you have this connection and all those that from this company. You know. They just throw you a lot of money, you know. Those were easy money, right? But when you try to be like a, uh, when, when the parent company has a problem, you know, your local company also not better to, to in some of the shape, you know, and that's why, you know, it was running very chaos at that time, you know, and then uh, we we call a stop, you know, try not to be running to uh, legal or all those problems, you know, we, we shut down the whole operation and we turn some of the money back, you know, and that, that's one of the good way to do it, you know, and else, Enron is, some of their CFO were commit suicide in them, and, and Dynergy were running into deep trouble you know, at that time, you know, and then we don't want to be engaged in those kind of political. We just want to make some money for living, and then we, we, we try to get around and just clean cut and, and do a clear operation. You know. So that was the worst case we had to sit in a board to make a decision. And because we don't want to ruin our career life, our future reputation, or all those things. You know. And then, of course, if we want to continue, we can have a successful, able to go IPO. You know. But I think we carry, just like, you know, we got some money from, I don't know, it's dirty or whatever, or unhealthy. So we have to do a clean cut, which is better for our future portfolio. You know. uh, then a lot of investors say, you're member, you know, in the board, you know, in the uh, management team is very smart enough to do this kind of decision and then later they continue to invest on us, you know, and do other things, you know, and then and lucky one by one we are able to deliver our mission goal, you know, and set our expectation clearly, you know, and then that's no problem. But because we are in high tech technology, you know, there's always a trend we, we just do it uh, just in time, everything is executed correctly, you know, and then your report is just like able to, at the end of the day, you know, they convince you know, you are in progress mode, you know, and in up you, not down you, or whatever, yeah. So I think it's very important, you know, you, you've got to be very 
honest in how to do do things and, and precisely, you know. And lots of, I mean, if you go to IPO, you know, you in particular in US today, you see in the board. If you don't do it carefully, the next day you see in the jail. Yeah, because that's the lots of Japanese, you know, they they are they are doing this kind of family style, you know, everything is owned by family. But when your company is IPO, controlled by uh, stock uh, exchange, you know, those options, all those things, rule and regulations, you know, uh, rule of law, you got to be very careful. You know? And then that's that's the advice, you know. Don't just say with well, the IPO, everything should be very comfortable. It's it's just the the beginning of another nightmare. Yeah. Okay. It's just another day. Yeah. Of course, if your company is healthy, it's good. Yeah. But if not, you know, you you got to be take enough or marathon or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. So it seems like if you if you're going to a bank to ask for money, they always ask how much money are you making, how much profit do you have, and if you go to a VC, they don't care if you're making money. Most startups don't make money for the first ten years. They just want to know how much your growth is. Like just all they do is care about is growth. And if you're merging, then they want to know what technology you have. Well, usually, when you try to merge, you know, whatever the company got to have a goal, you know, try to look for the company, you know, they may be uh, acquired by another big uh, investors. For example, you know, uh, A is already quite successful in Gartner top three quadrants, right? The leadership, whatever. But some of the investor they buy it for, let's say they buy it for three billions, right? They expect to sell it for six billion. And then I think when they delist the company, you know, they start to try to hunt for whatever will compliments the end-to-end -end solution or their technology able to complement as a full picture. For example, if you Let's say you they just like to buy a car like a McLaren, right? I don't know how many people like cars, you know. I like a car called McLaren. It's illegal to manufacture now because it's a three seater. There's one seater, it's an F1, you know, there's two seater in the back. Yeah. This kind of design is illegal in everywhere now. Yeah. There's only a one car manufactured like that. And a lot of people will buy this kind of trash or whatever the car, you know. They just refurnish it, you know. Same technology, you know, they will buy a company, you know, it's have very good backbone or whatever, you know, and then they project, you know, the technology is uphill for the next 10 years. But if they able to add another few more companies into this, become a completely, you know, in Chinese say, you, you like a, uh, a flower, you know, a rose. By any other name, it's still a rose, but you got to have leaves. If you peel up all the leaves, you know, it looks very ugly, right? So they have to peel up something like as a flower when you give to another investor, you know, it's, it's whatever, you know. And it looks pretty. So this is the company they, they look for, you know, so... And because they want to make it better, you know, they cannot buy a very cheap, dirty one, right? You know, you've got to be whatever the class they buy is the same class, you know. If you're in that class, point to their range and their portfolio, you know, you can negotiate very good. So that's a good way to merge of the company, you know. And but if the company, the, usually in, in the uh, Wall Street or, or Nasdaq, there are some company, you know, maybe just flat for three years. What does it mean, you know? If a company, you know, your profit or whatever, you know, revenue is flat for three years, that means that company is getting old, you know, because in Chinese, you know, uh, you know, it's just waiting for. They are not dying, but they are just hanging there, you know, it's just like... So, you have to be careful, you know, when you try to merge with this kind of company, you know, you, were you able to jumpstart the whole picture or not, you know, else you'll be just sucked into a black hole, and you become a black uh, or, or whatever, you know, and then they, they will do whatever. And, and also, you know, I think uh, I worked for Larry before, you know, and Larry is... Larry Allison, yeah, yeah. right, Oracle, yeah. They have very good like a portfolio uh, management, you know, they, they know how to merge in acquisition, you know, they will buy the company. For example, I, I work for PeopleSoft, you know, they just buy the company and they kill the a technology, you know, they just want the customer, you know. But if you are those kind of thing, you know, you have those kind of technology and you have whatever, you know, and unless they are hostile takeover and they give pay you a lot of money, then you give up, you know, because whatever, you are, you are the tough guy, you are Superman, you are Iron Man, you know, and then you could be everything, right? But I just want the cash, you know, 
and then uh, but if you are not you know try to find a way you know you you should be able to find something you know similar to your company you know? just like you are often you know if you ask you somebody to adopt you will you have the choice to select somebody as a parent yeah and uh, I don't know you know it's just there's so many ways you know some of the company I work for you know and, and also we are doing similar thing you know, and we have to make the decision and for example you know uh, the the some ecosystem right you know uh, Scott Manili is a close friend of mine. You know, he got no choice because the company has a lot of hardware good. And then when you are in the wrong time, in the wrong area, in the wrong uh, investment, you know, and then they end up with only IBM able to buy some microsystem or Oracle, right? So in between IBM and Oracle, of course you have to buy meet with something close to your idea and also similar, you know, because IBM buy they have Redundance of Unix system. They have uh, like a R6, R6000 uh, Linux or whatever, you know. So they will kill some, you know. That's why it shouldn't be going through like that, you know. And then they just go for Oracle, you know. And Oracle is a uh, cash cow, you know. They're rich enough, you know. And then they guarantee to suck up all those uh, science skill and technology. And then that's one of the things you have to look for, you know, when you try to merge, you know. It's an uphill merge or it's a downhill merge, you know, or whatever, you have to make a decision, you know, or it's an equal to equal merge, whatever, you know. And then, uh, I think most of you guys probably don't have those kind of stage yet, you know, but if you are big enough, you know, have to merge with somebody, you know, that, that's an artwork, you know, time may be changed, you know, whatever I tell you today, the theory will be different, maybe 10 years from now. Because when I look back, you know, when I was doing in, in investment, in year 2000 to year 2005 to uh, 2010 and then up from now you know, it's very very disruptive right now it's very disrupting you, 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 you can't even predict a company how long they they will able to last you know, if, if, yeah because it's getting faster and faster you know. if you look at like a 60 50s right a lot of company able to last 30 40 years or even longer 100 years company you know. But now a lot of companies, they, they not even though able to turn around for more than 10 years. Their technology, if their technology shift is fast enough, you know, that means there will be a lot of debt made on the floor. Right? You know, or either you, if you're smart enough, you know, you know your technology able, should not be able to shift to other stage, you know, just sell it, dump it right away. You know, and then, unless you know your technology is very good, you know, and I know, for example, Google, at that time they tried to sell to Yahoo for 10 million, you know, Yahoo doesn't have the vision to see it, you know, and then uh, Sergey and uh, Larry, you know, decided, okay, we drop the school and make the Google works, yeah, and then, and they, they have enough energy, you know, and the, the key part is, you know, all right, I want everybody to think of, uh, think of your questions, if the question's ready, we should uh, Oh yeah, so so I forgot where. I <laughs> okay, so I, I think you know, uh, yeah, when 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 your company you know is uh, have the technology shift, you know, able to do the leadership, you know, try to keep it, you know, as what I have seen, you know, most people, you know, in terms of uh, biology, biological, you know, all those things, you know, about from plus and minus five years of age between 25 and 26 they are very energetic to do this kind of thing they are very creative and continuity are very good you know and if you're more than I, I, I shouldn't put this you know it become age discrimination you know and but if you are young and loving aggressive you're able to work very disruptive for example Alibaba right I was looking at Alibaba in AWS, they are very similar, right? But you look at AWS, they are very inflated, you know, they are maybe too expensive. I would not even try to invest on AWS, you know, but you, you look at Alibaba, if it drop to 110 US dollar or whatever, you know, it's a good buy. For the 10 years later, I think this company will be somebody else, you know, but don't call on me, you know, I'm not in coach <laughs> on this, right? But given that, you know, you can see their employee, you know, their employee was working, there's new, new terms, they call it 
used to be they call it 996, which is like a Porsche 996 model. Right? No, it's not. It means they're working from 9 to 9, 6 days a week. But now they shift to 007, 007. That means midnight to midnight, seven days a week. You know, I mean, how can you compete with a company like that? You know, they're working like a star, even superstar plus. And then everybody is locked inside, like a, in Zhejiang, uh, Sichu, that area, right? And then it's full of energy. You know, all of them is about like a, whatever you try to compete with them. You no, know? I, I will not encourage you to try to do that because they have money, they have people, they have time and they have the uh, relationship, everything. You know? So, but if you do in other field, you know, you try to go for it, yeah, yeah. And then take your, your, your energy, you know, your, when you're young, you know, it's very good to pursue your goal and dream, yeah. And then you have to read your biological clock, you know, and, and try to do the sound and right decision.